Brown and the Secret of the Shadow, the Codebearer series, book one, written by the Miller brothers. Chapter one, the worst last day ever. It was the last day of school and I was running for my life. My best friends and I had just pulled off one of our best pranks ever. It's not like we were trying to get in trouble or anything. It's just that we were determined to get even with the school bully before summer break. After all, Cranton had gone out of his way more than once to make my life miserable this year, so it wasn't as if he didn't deserve it. Besides, the last day of school was the perfect time for, for payback. Stretch and I had planned the whole thing out weeks in advance. We called it Project Fireball, an elaborate scheme that required hijacking a bag of brownies from my sister's bake sale and modifying them with a bottle of Stu's unreasonably hot, wicked hot sauce. All we needed was a decoy. Kitty Swanson, the most popular girl in the whole school, had been Cranton's crush for the entire year and was the perfect candidate. The object was simple, objective was simple enough. Inject the brownies with hot sauce, leave them in, in a bag on Cranton's reserved cafeteria table, along with a note from Kitty, Kitty in the girliest handwriting we could manage. Stretch and I wait, watched with anticipation, recording every moment of our latest attempt to humiliate Cranton on my video camera. If everything went as planned, we would be posting the footage on our website for the whole world to see. It would be the 13th and final instalment um, installment of our online video series. Our subscriber list had grown considerably over the school year as we devised and recorded some of the greatest pranks ever achieved by a student at Destiny Hills High School. Stubbs, the third men member of our enterprise, sat to my left cleaning out his pudding cup with his index finger, completely unaware of the events that were about to unfold. It was better that he didn't know. He was terrified of Cranton and had labelled him an untouchable, as far as pranks go, and for a good reason. Cranton was the self-proclaimed leader of the so-called Cobras, a gang of high school thugs who loved picking on the, their weaker classmates. Nope, it didn't take a genius to know that Cranton was trouble, but the way we figured, what Stubbs didn't, didn't know couldn't hurt him. Adjusting the focus, I held back a smile as Cranton eagerly read the forged note we had planted. Cranton, I'll miss you this summer, Kitty. He looked inside the bag and turned a raised eyebrow at Kitty, seated at a nearby table, feeling his uncomfortable gaze um, over her shoulder, she turned to see who it was. Her face contorted in disgust as she looked quickly away. Oh man, did you get that on tape? Stretch half whispered, trying to keep from laughing. Yeah, I got it. That was priceless. I can no longer contain the broad smile that now crept across my face as I anticipated Cranton's next move. Keeping my eye trained on the small LCD screen, I adjusted the zoom so that Cranton's face nearly filled the whole screen. What's going on? Stubbs asked, suddenly aware of our intense preoccupation. What do you guys... Shh, just watch. Stretch interrupted in a hushed tone, gesturing towards Cranton's table. At the last, at last, the moment had arrived. Biting into one of the tainted brownies, Cranton's face lit up with a goofy smile. At first, he appeared unfazed and even began preparing for a second bite. Then, without warning, his confidence faded. His eyebrows lowered and his chewing slowed. There was a brief pause for a moment as the effects of the hot sauce began to kick in. Suddenly, Cranton half spat, spat half puked the searing sweets all over the table and guzzled down the remainder of his soda pop in an attempt to ease the pain, spilling some of it down his face and neck in the process. The students around him erupted in a mixture of confused laughter and disgust. Cranton's eyes searched furiously um, around the room and met with mine through the viewfinder. His expression hardened, and in that moment I realised that somehow he knew. A sudden burst of, of, of adrenaline, adrenaline rushed through my veins. It was time to run. So that's how it started. The three of us were being hunted down like fugitives by Cranton and his gang, and since there weren't many new places to hide on our school property. We had to, well, get creative. <laughs> Slipping around the corner of the gym, I spotted a dumpster, and we quickly go, go, dove in, letting the lid shut tightly behind us. Within moments, we heard the footsteps of our angry victim and his cobra, cobra crew as they sped past, hollering and cussing as they ran. 
Our plan had worked for now, or so it seemed. All we had left to do was wait in silence until the school bell announced the end of lunch. By then, we figured out it would be too late for Crenton to do anything before school let out for the summer. That was close, I panted nervously, trying to catch my breath. Did you see the look on his face when he realised those brownies were filled with hot sauce? I couldn't help but chuckle. Stretch was the first to respond. I have to admit, it was more of your... It was one of your more brilliant plans, and he totally deserved it too after giving me that automatic wedgie yesterday. It still hurts to sit down in class. Stretch had been an easy target for Cranton all year. He stood out because of his long, lanky legs, freckled face, and bright, bright red frizzy hair. But his looks were only half of the problem. Stretch was what you might call a mathlete, a nice way of saying math geek. Math geek. Which was okay with me, because it was one of the only classes in, uh, in school I was any good at, thanks to his tutoring. He was also one of the most pliable people I knew. You could get him to go along with just about anything, which was great to have as a friend. But it also made teasing him a pretty easy task. Stubbs was a different story. I could tell he wasn't pleased. You guys are nuts. You could have gotten us killed. Yep, he was furious. Do me a favour, next time you decide to prank an untouchable, leave me out. He had a point. He hadn't asked to be included in our little prank. He was simply guilty by our association. Stubbs was nearly a year younger than me, and about four foot four inches was and at four foot four inches was considerably short for his age too. Especially standing next to Stretch. His real name was Clarence, but we called him Stubbs because he was the most stubborn person we knew. You'd never, if you ever suggested an idea that didn't fit him with his carefully constructed comfort zone, you could be sure he'd let you know about it and wouldn't change his mind. We often wondered if he was actually allergic to anything that posed a challenge. Even the mere mention of something adventure, adventuresome would spark an asthma attack that could only be calmed by his trusty yellow inhaler, which he made sure to carry with him everywhere. Fortunately, his family was pretty well off, and that made hanging out with him a bit more fun. Five minutes later, we heard the school bell ring. Lunch was over. We were going to be late to class if we didn't hurry. Pushing up on the dun dumpster lid, we discovered we were in a heap of trouble. The lid wouldn't budge. It was latched shut. We were stuck. You've got to be kidding me. Stubbs wasn't getting any happier. First you get me in trouble with Canton, and now I'm locked in a dumpster. Great, way to go, Hunter. Breathing heavily, he fumbled for his inhaler and took a quick puff of medication before continuing the tirade. I hope your little prank was worth it. I tried to keep calm. After all, I was pretty much the unofficial leader of the group. We're going to get out of here, don't worry. Let's just make a mu as, not as much noise as we possibly can, and someone's bound to hear us. Several minutes later, we pounded, we pounded on the dumpster and screamed out as loud as we could, but it was no use. Our ears were ringing from the racket, and, but we had not managed to catch anyone's attention. The situation was hopeless. Oh man, Stretch whined, I have to pee. How much longer do you think we'll be in here? If no one finds us, we could easily be locked in here for days, Stubbs spurted out. Days? I can't be stuck in here that long. I've got a chess match tomorrow. I'm challenging the Grand Master. It's a big deal. Stretch was starting to freak out. His eyes darted between Stubbs and me, searching for a little sympathy and finding none. A chess match was the least of our worries at this point. I had long since given up trying to understand Stretch's fascination with the game. I mean, the guy was obsessed with it. He even carried around a chess piece in his pocket that he called his lucky knight. It was the piece he had used to win his first competition. Chess to me was boring. He complained every year that our school district didn't have its own chess clubs, to, so his parents drove him to the neighbouring school district to compete. We had encouraged him to start his own club, but he lacked the drive to do anything on his own. It suddenly dawned on him. Wait a minute, Stubbs, do you have your cell phone? By ninth grade, all the lucky kids carried cell phones. Stubbs went beyond lucky. Not only did he have a cell phone, but he had the new Z phone, the envy of everyone at school. 
His parents had given to it to him on his 14th birthday. The Z phone was the hottest device in the market. You could send a, he could send a text message to someone in class who could bail us out of this mess. Oh yeah, I almost forgot. He flipped it open and frantically started typing a message to a classmate. He was just about to send the message when the phone chirped and the screen went blank. Well, that's funny. The screen won't light up. Oh no. What? Stretch asked. The battery's dead. I must have forgotten to plug it in last night after I finished downloading those new ringtones you told me about. Stretch and I groaned at the news and the string of bad luck we'd just run into. What had we done to deserve this? The dumpster was considerably dark. Our only light source coming from a few, few small holes near the top. And what little glow remained from Albert Einstein's face on Stretch's glow-in-the-dark t-shirt. The guy had no fashion sense. We were dirty, stinky, and incredibly late for class. Things couldn't have gotten worse. Our teacher, Miss White, would probably write us up for a detention and our parents would find out about the whole thing. And then, a miracle. Hang on, I think I hear someone coming, I said. Sure enough, we could hear the cr um, crackling of footsteps on gravel, not far from where we were. Banging on the sides of the dumpsters, we screamed frantically for help. At this point, we didn't care if it was Cranton who found us. Getting beat up would be far better than our current situation. Click, ka chunk, creak. My heart thumped faster as the lid began to open. The figure of our rescuer was temporarily silhouetted by a sudden burst of painful daylight. What have we here? The man's voice was deep, raspy, and authoritative. The type of guy who you didn't say no to. Forcing my aching, teary eyes to open, I squinted to catch a glimpse of the stranger who had just saved us from the city dump. As my eyes adjusted to the light, I met the silvery gaze of one of the toughest-looking old guys I'd ever seen. His face was tan, weathered, and rough. His bright white hair pulled back in a ponytail. He wore a short, scraggly beard and a stern look of a gunslinger who was sizing up his opponent. He was dressed in a dark blue jumpsuit and a white t-shirt that barely covered his escaping chest hair. He must be the janitor on duty, I thought to myself. <laughs> so, what are you boys up to? He inquired while holding up the dumpster lid with one hand. Thought you could skip class now, did you? No, sir. We got stuck in here playing hide and seek, I lied. He narrowed his eyes and watched us intently as we clambered out of the dumpster and breathed in the fresh air. The janitor raised a brow. So it wouldn't have anything to do with your little lunch room fiasco, would it? We were busted. How did you? I started to ask. Oh, don't be so modest, Hunter. It's all over school. They're calling you. What was it again? Ah, uh, yes. Hunter the prank master. For a moment, I felt a sense of pride. I was famous. Maybe even cool. Then he added, I'm sure the principal will be equally impressed. The good feeling was gone. Oh, I said lamely. Hey, Hunter. How come you're getting all the credit? Stretch was feeling left out. It was my idea, too. Stubbs was the last to get out, rolling over the edge of the dumpster and toppling onto the ground. Just for the record, I had nothing to do with it. These guys planned everything and drug me, in, drug me into it. You're not really going to tell the principal, are you? Stretch pleaded with, with the man, who almost smiled in return, enjoying our predicament so far. Y you know... Since it's the last day of school, I think I might be able to help you out, but it's only fair that you do me a small favour. What exactly did you have in mind? And I winced, half expecting the three of us to be scrubbing the boys' bathroom after school. Well, for starters, the boys' bathroom is a mess and needs to be thoroughly cleaned before they close school for the summer. So you three can help, he paused for effect, a hint of a smile crossing his lips, by running an errand for me this afternoon. Whew! Stretch accepted the deal before my better judgment raised a question. Anything, just don't tell Principal Piccola. The man grinned at the description in his voice. Um, good. I won't tell us all. Listen closely. An important item is on hold at a bookshop downtown. The man said as he scribbled on the back of a business card. Give the owner this card. He'll be expecting you. I took the card and examined it quickly. The front was bright and white and completely blank, except for a curious glossy logo that could only be seen when angled in the light just right. 
The logo is composed of a symbol that looked something like a W at the centre of the card, surrounded by a circle. Turning the card over, I found the address marked out in sloppy penmanship. 1421 Lathrop, Lane, Lathrop Avenue. If you hurry, you should still be able to pick it up and be back here in a half hour before the school's out. Meet me in the boys' bathroom. Got it? We nodded in agreement. It was an odd request, to say by the least. But with the newfound freedom, we headed out to the retrieve this item of importance for our custodial saviour. Little did I know this seemingly innocent errand would forever change the course of my life. We made our way to the address written on the back of the card. The small used bookstore had only a few books, was only a few blocks away from school, but I had never noticed it before. There was no surprise, as I rarely ever read books. A sign in the window advertised book repair services, though I couldn't imagine why anyone would want to repair a book. Heaving open the heavy wooden door, we were greeted by several mangy cats and the smell of old books and garlic. Phew, stretched Wince. It smells worse than the dumpster in here. Five wooden bookshelves ran the length of the floor, slightly askew from the aging floorboards that gave the room a crooked feeling. The aisles between the shelves were narrow, uncluttered, and drew our eyes to the far back of the bookstore, where an oversized oak counter sat unoccupied. The front of the counter was scattered with flyers advertising local events that had long since passed, an antique cash register that only a a select few would still have been able to operate. A silver bell was conveniently placed near the edge of the counter with a handwritten, handwritten note taped to it that read, Ring for service. Ding, ding, ding. We rang the bell. I'll be right with you, a small voice called out from the back of the counter. An odd-looking man with short legs, wispy hair, and magnified spectacles on an oversized nose shuffled out with a pile of books stacked much too high. Just finishing inventory. These books don't take care of themselves, you know. Whoa. A black cat ran out from behind the counter with a yowl as the ancient store owner tumbled to the ground, sending one, the once neatly sorted pile of books flying in every direction. Oh, bother, he sighed as he lifted himself off from the floor. I suppose I'll have to start all over it now, won't I? Book by book, he restacked the pile as we waited. When the last book was gathered, he turned to a clipboard and began humming and flipping casually through the sheets of paper that were attached to it. A full minute passed before I began to wonder if he had forgotten about us altogether. Ahem. I cleared my throat in an effort to catch his attention. Yes, how can I help you, gentlemen? He simply replied without even looking up from his work. We're here to give you- we were told to give you this. He passed the card across the counter, capturing his full attention at last. There's something we were supposed to pick up. Well, now, let's see what we have here. He turned the card over in his hands and then looked back at us, squinting down over the counter through his magnified spectacles as if examining a bug. Was this all you were given? The man asked, though I wasn't entirely sure it was really a question. Yes. The man who gave it to us um, said you would be expecting us. The man's face brightened. Indeed I was. And you're precisely on time too, he said, pointing to a contraption um, that looked like a grandfather clock. Um, That was unlike anything I'd ever seen. A series of abstract symbols circled the face and a single arm moved quickly to the second symbol from the top. Just one moment then, I know exactly what you need. He disappeared again behind the oak desk, leaving us alone for the moment. Don't look now, Stubbs whispered, but I think we're being surrounded. Turning around, we found ourselves encircled by nearly 20 cats eyeing us with uncanny intelligence. This place gives me the creeps, Stubbs shuddered, and I'm achoo, he sneezed forcefully, allergic to cats. Let's get out of here. Let's just finish our errand and get back before... The bookkeeper popped up before I could finish. Here it is, he said, presenting what appeared to be a large book 
wrapped tightly in cloth and it was tied shut with twine. The invoice shows it was paid in full, so unless you need anything else. No, I answered abruptly, hoisting the heavy book off the counter. We'll just let ourselves out. With that, I turned to go. Wait, the man hollered. You'll need this as well. His age-worn hand held a golden key that was meant to accompany the package. Keep it with you at all times. Leading it till he could lead to grave consequences, I'm afraid. Without thinking, I snatched the key from his grasp, from his grip, and buried it in my coat pocket, much to the dismay of the old man. You're welcome. And with that, he disappeared to the back of the room for the last time. Oh, uh, thanks. I called back awkwardly, now keenly aware of how rude I'd been. Clutching the book beneath my arm, I tiptoed around the cat's and out the front door with stretch and stubs. Now all we had to do was get the book back to the janitor before school was out, and we could be home free for the summer. Back at school, we headed straight for the boys' bathroom, where we were to meet the janitor, but there was no sign of him. Judging from the smell, it hadn't been cleaned either. Leaving the bathroom, we, were set, we set out in the search of the janitor, and we were about to give up when we were rounded a corner and ploughed straight into pr Principal Pickler. Teetering on her high heels, the startled principal toppled to the ground amidst a snowfall of office paper. What are you three doing out of class? We were running an errand across town to... I started to answer, but I didn't get far. Stop right there. Pickler cut me off, raising her hand sternly. What did you just say? Leaving the premises during school hours is strictly prohibited for students. She scolded as she gathered her papers together. Who sent you? I tried to explain. The janitor sent us to get this. He said it was important. I handed her the package, which she unwrapped to reveal an antique book with a latch and a keyhole. It must have been unlocked because it opened easily and she flipped through the pages easily. From where I stood, I could tell that every page in the book was blank, an empty journal. There was nothing of importance in the pool. Piccolo was getting annoyed. Hogwash. Our janitor is gone today. He phoned in sick last night. Besides, even if he were here, he would most certainly not be authorised to give kids permission to wander off school property. You have to come with me. Seated quietly outside Pico's office, we waited for the verdict while she discussed the situation with our teacher. I hope you're proud of yourself, Hunter, Grip, griped Stubbs. Do you even realise that I had a perfect attendance record until today? Now I might as well have a big black tardy written on my forehead for the rest of my life. Do they really keep track of stuff like that? Stretch wondered aloud. Oh yeah, Stubbs insisted. The offered records and everything. I don't, I'll doubt I'll even make it into a good college. I'll probably end up living in a van. I tried to calm him down. Hey, it's not my fault. Besides, once they realise we're telling the truth, your record will be cleared. Trust me. Stubbs disagreed. Do you expect them to believe us? They probably think we're lying about all of this. As far as they're concerned, we're just ninth grade losers who tried to skip class on the last day of school and got busted. He was right. Of course they wouldn't be they wouldn't believe us. It didn't help that the janitor had mysteriously disappeared. Our description of him didn't match any other member on of staff. And what was worse, we didn't even know his name. We had nothing. Miss White and Miss Pickler came out of the office. As unlikely as your story is, we have to take it seriously. Frankly, as we're, frankly, we're concerned about the person posing as school custodian, wandering out of the facilities. Did anyone else see this man? My mind was racing. The invoice, I shouted, leaping from my chair, surprising myself in the process. The bookstore owner said the package was paid in full. If we go back now and explain the situation... Maybe we could look at the invoice and find the janitor's name. At the very least, I figured the owner would vouch for us and um, being there this afternoon to prove we hadn't lied about where we went. My enthusiasm must have worked because somehow we managed to convince Piccolo to follow us to the bookstore. That was when things took a very weird turn. The shop was gone, disappeared, vanished into thin air. That was... A it was as if someone had taken stores on either side of it and pinched them together over the top of where the bookstore was once. No bookstore, no bookstop, no bookkeeper, no invoice. No way, Stubbs was in shock. 
We were just here, I swear. The bookshop was right between the TV repair shop and the hardware store. I promise. And the Pickler came unglued. Oh, I get it. This is another one of your pranks, isn't it, Hunter? No, ma'am. I... The question was apparently rhetorical, as she showed no intention of listening to my plea of innocence. I can't believe I trusted you guys. This is the lamest excuse for an excuse I've ever heard. I tried to cut in, but she was just getting warmed up. Well, you've clearly wasted my time, and now I'm going to waste yours. Congratulations, boys. You've just earned yourself a detention. When we get back, I'm calling your parents, and you're going to spend the rest of your afternoon clearing the boys' bathroom. The summer was off to a terrible start.